as we continue to look at the, some of the signs of the times that are uh, telling us that uh, the Son of God uh, is uh, soon to come. Pretty soon, we're going to see Him in the clouds of glory. I'd like you to turn with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're going to look at uh, a passage here dealing with uh, the second coming of Jesus Christ. But there is uh, a particular passage there, a particular sentence there that I would like for you to look at with me as followers of uh, Jesus Christ. Again, we, we are going to 1 Th Thessalonians chapter 5. Notice with me, the Apostle Paul says in uh, verse 1, notice, he says, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Now, the reason why the Apostle Paul got into the times and the season, it's, it's a, a follow-up of what he just said in uh, chapter 4. He was describing the second coming. He was describing the event that would take place at, at the second coming at, when the Son of Man, when the Son of God, when our loving Savior comes in the clouds of glory. Then uh, he proceeded by saying, verse 1 again of chapter 5, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh how? The day of the Lord will come as a thief, meaning it will come unexpectedly. When uh, the world, even uh, the so-called Christians, uh, are not really expecting him to come, he will come as a thief. Then he says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But notice with me carefully now, this is an admonition or counsel, this is talking to you and I. We have the times and the season that we don't need to know, but as Jesus says, we can look at the signs, we can study the Word of God and compare them with current events and we can know, we can tell, we can say without a shadow of a doubt uh, that the second coming of Jesus Christ uh, is imminent. Even though we do not know the day or the hour, so when we look at what's developing around us in our world and compare them with what a dust say after Lord, we know that uh, for sure that these are indicators or indications that Jesus is coming again. The second coming is imminent. This is why the Apostle Paul says now, verse 4, But ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Why? Notice verse 5. The, verse 5 answers that question. Ye are all the children of light. So what kind of children are we? We are the children of light. Now the word light there is, a, is also referring to the Word of God. The Word of God is the light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Well, we get, we gain our understanding by studying scriptures, by studying prophecies. And now I, again, as I mentioned, when we look at what's, ha what's happening, what's developing, around us, we can say, based on uh, what the Bible says, based on prophecy, that Jesus is coming again. We can say that it is not business as usual, and uh, we must get ready, get ready, get ready, so that that day will not uh, come to us as a thief, as it will come to many. Again, he says, verse 4 one more time, But ye brethren are not in uh, darkness. If we are not in darkness, where are we? That that day again should overtake you as a thief. This is where we should be. This is where we are. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of a darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and uh, do what again? And be sober, for they that sleep sleep in the night. And a day that be drunken are drunken in the night. So as we are seeing events that are developing in our world today and comparing them once again with the Word of God 
And as Jesus gave uh, the disciples in Matthew 24, signs of the times, things that they should look for, that would help them to know that uh, His coming is soon so that they can be ready. After all, that was the reason why God has given us uh, prophecy. He has given us prophecy to help us, to be prepared, to be ready, so that uh, we would not have any excuse, so that we could not bring uh, any kind of accusation against God and say, well, I did not know. Well, again, He gave them prophecies to help them to remember what's developing in our world and uh, where we should be at this time. One of the signs of the times, let's go to the book of uh, Matthew with me, Matthew chapter 25. Now keep in mind, in the book of Matthew chapter 25, uh, is, uh, chapter 25 is a con continuation of uh, Matthew 24. Remember again uh, that the disciples came to Jesus, asked Him for signs of the times. By way of review, they came to Him uh, Let's look at, well, before we go to chapter 25, let's look at chapter 24. Again, by way of review. And uh, the, the Bible says in verse 1, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, notice, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? As we covered before, and we'll continue to cover this because the Word of God never gets old, he gave them signs, wars and rumors of wars, famine, pestilences, and persecution that will come upon his, uh, his people. But as he continues to uh, give them signs and uh, make com a comparison with other stories that we read from the Word of God, like, uh, like it was in the days of Noah, Jesus said, like it was in the days of Lot. So these are the, some of the signs that we should look for that would help us to understand that Jesus is on His way. Then uh, as we come to chapter 25, uh, Jesus uh, again uh, continuing uh, the, the dialogue, the same conversation, the signs of the times, and then now he gets into the kind of preparation that uh, his uh, disciples, his people should be making so that that day should not take them uh, as a thief or by surprise. But one of the signs of the times we want to look at quickly here is uh, this sign here that we find in Matthew 25. Uh, and uh, notice with me, in uh, verse, uh, let's begin in verse 31. He says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all the nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. But He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say, notice with me carefully, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Who are these individuals that would receive this generous, this kind invitation there? Notice with me, the Bible goes on to say in verse 35, For, notice now, that's the answer to the question, Who are these individuals? For I was in hunger and uh, he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and he gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. So who is Jesus referring to here? Which class of people is he referring to? That is uh, the poor, the needy, that he's referring to. So according to Revelation 13, we also saw that there will be two classes of people, the rich and the poor. And one of the reasons why the majority will receive the mark of the beast, it is because of lack of food, lack of their basic necessity. As we saw before in India, how many, the poorest, 
are going along with the system, this biometric system, this cashless society that they have in India because otherwise they would not be able to buy or sell. So Jesus says that uh, when you do service, when you help the needy, notice, let's keep reading God's word. He goes on to say, verse 36, Naked, he says, and ye clothed me, I was sick, and ye visited me, I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Notice, Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee, a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king, notice the answer there, shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it to whom? You have done it unto, unto me. So Jesus expects us to what? To take care of the needy, to help the poor. Again, as I mentioned, based on Revelation chapter 13, verses 16, and 17 there will be two classes of people the rich and the poor as it was in the days uh, during the days of the dark ages many will receive the mark of the beast once again uh, because of their basic necessity so Christ expects us as he did for you and I we were poor naked miserable in our sin and what did he do for our sake the Bible says he became uh, poor so that uh, we might inherit uh, eternity, so that we might inherit uh, glory, we might inherit uh, everything, even sitting uh, at the throne of God, as we read about in Revelation chapter 2. So Jesus expects us to make these type of sacrifices in these last days, uh, as he did for you, and for me, we're talking about uh, the poor in these last days, one of the signs of the times. And as we see things uh, the way they're heading right now, with uh, the measures the nations of, this, of uh, this world are taking, implementing a system, a biometric, a cashless society system, who do you think will suffer the most? It is the poor. So those of us who have the means even uh, if you do not have much, Christ expects me, Christ expects us uh, to make sacrifices uh, to help those uh, that are less fortunate than you and I. And as a result of this, uh, many of them uh, will not receive uh, the mark of the beast. Notice with me what Sister White says here. From uh, Adventist Home, 370, she says, uh, if we represent, notice with me carefully, the character of Christ, every particle of selfishness must be expelled from the soul. In carrying forward the work He gave to our hands, it will be necessary for us, notice, to give every jot and title of our what? Means that we can spare. Notice now, poverty and distress in families will come to our knowledge. And afflicted and suffering ones will have to be relieved. Then it says, God's stewards are to minister to whom? To the needy. As we just read there in uh, Matthew chapter 25 again, he says, uh, verse 35, For I was in hunger, and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and he gave me drink. I was a stranger, and what did you do? And you took me in. Then skip on down to verse 40. He says, And the king shall say unto, unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. The Bible again says in Luke. Go to the book of Luke with me. Luke chapter 4. The book of Luke chapter 4. And notice now. In Luke chapter 4, again the background is Jesus came back to Nazareth after fasting in the wilderness 40 days. He experienced hunger. He, he was homeless. No shelter. 
in the wilderness, even uh, doing uh, his three and a half years of ministry. He did not have uh, a place uh, to lay his head, the Bible says. Again, notice with me, the Bible says uh, in uh, verse uh, 18, he came to Nazareth, they, he went to the temple on the Sabbath, they gave him the book to read. Then verse 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to whom? To the, to the poor. Who was the first class of people there? That the Bible says, uh, Jesus himself says, that uh, the Spirit of the Lord uh, that was upon him uh, was uh, directing him to pre preach the gospel to the poor. And uh, that is uh, all of us. It doesn't matter if we have millions of dollars in the bank. There are two ways uh, that we are poor here, physically speaking and also spiritually speaking. That's all of us. So he left eternity. He left glory and came here because we were poor, naked, miserable. He came here to preach the gospel unto us and to heal our brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised, to set at liberty, to let us, to set us free. That's redemption, to buy us back, to give us everything. He made the exchange. He became rich so that we might become, uh, he became poor rather, he became poor so that we might become rich in him. So one of the signs of the times that Jesus gave us in Matthew 25 is the poor, to take care of the poor. Let's go to the book of Proverbs with me. We're going to Proverbs, rather, Proverbs chapter 19. Let's go to the book of Proverbs chapter 19. And the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 19, speaking of the poor, it says, let's look at verse 1. It says, Better is the poor that walketh in his uh, how? It, integrity than he that is perverse uh, in his lips uh, and is a water and is, uh, is a fool. Now skip on down with me. Skip on down to verse 17. It says, He that hath pity upon the poor, Lendeth unto whom? Lendeth unto the Lord. And that which he hath given, what will happen to him? Will he pay him again? So whatever we give to the poor, whatever sacrifices that we made to the poor, keep in mind Matthew chapter 25 that we just read. Jesus says, when you do that, when you make this type of sacrifices, you have done it unto me. You've done it for me. So the Bible says once again, he that have pity upon the poor, lendeth unto whom? Unto the Lord. It's similar to what Jesus says, lay not for yourself treasures upon the earth, but invest your means, your talents into the kingdom where it will not get corrupt, rust. Again, he says, when you make a sacrifice, when you help the poor, when you have pity upon the poor, you are lending to the Lord and that which He have given, what will the Lord do? He will repay again. Chapter 28 this time of the same book. Chapter 28, the Bible says, notice with me, in chapter 28, verse 27, He says, He that giveth unto the poor shall not, what? Lack. But he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. Hideth his eyes from helping the needy. Hideth his eyes from showing affection and showing love towards one who are struggling. So again, he that giveth unto the poor shall what? No lack. Another verse that confirms that God will supply for you and I. Notice with me, another one here. This time uh, we go into chapter 22. Go backward. Chapter 22, verse 9 of chapter 22. The Bible says once again, He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed. Notice, well, for what reason? For he giveth of his bread to whom? To the poor. For he giveth his bread unto whom? To the poor. So you see how God wants us to help the poor. The needy, God wants us to make these type of sacrifices. And when you do that, 
you are doing for Christ. Remember again, Christ did not have a, a home. He did not have a place. He was uh, depending on the hospitality of others who would show kindness, who would invite him uh, to spend uh, one night at their place. So we, again, we are reminded that when we help others, sometimes angels can will disguise in a form of a human person and, uh, that, and they will do that to test you and I to see if we would lend a hand to them. Another passage here. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy this time. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy chapter 15. Notice with me what the Word of God says in chapter 15 of uh, the book of Deuteronomy beginning in verse 7. Chapter 15 beginning in verse 7. And the Bible says, speaking to the children of Israel, If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from the poor brother. But thou shalt open thine hand wide, it says, unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. So don't just give him a little bit here. You have to make sure that if you're helping, that you, you help that person to meet their need. Again, it goes on to say, verse 9, Beware, it says, that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, the seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thy givest him not, and uh, he cried unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. Thou, notice now, thou shalt surely give him and thine heart, uh, notice the blessing there, shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because that for this thing the Lord that God shall bless thee in all thy works and in all that uh, thou puttest thine hand unto. For notice, for the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I commend thee, saying, Thou shalt uh, open uh, thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor and to thy needy, in the, thy land. Again, God promised uh, a blessing to those of us uh, who help uh, those who are less fortunate uh, than us. This is the reason why the church uh, is called a house for the sick, a house for the sinners, a house for, for the needy. Let's look at another passage. Go back to Proverbs this time, chapter 14 of the book of Proverbs. Go back again to Proverbs chapter 14 with me. And we'll begin in verse 21 of Proverbs chapter 14. The Word of God says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 21, He says, He, well, are you there? It says, He that despiseth his neighbor sinneth, but he that hath mercy on who? On the poor, happy what? Happy is he. So those who have mercy on the poor, happy is he. Now, why is this uh, such an important subject? Because uh, our Lord Jesus says, once again in Matthew 25, uh, which was part of the answer that he gave uh, to the disciples after they asked him questions about signs of the times. He said uh, one of the things that uh, is required of us is part of our preparation, making sure that we help uh, one another, making sure that uh, there is no lack. As a matter of fact, when, uh, when you look at the, the church, the way the church was structured, we'll look at that in a moment, uh, the disciples, uh, the believers had no lack. They came together and they make sure that all the needs uh, were met. Again, as we look at Revelation chapter 13 again, uh, go back to Revelation chapter 13, uh, Again, a very familiar passage, Revelation chapter 13. We see two classes of people again in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation, beginning in verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, notice, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man 
my buyer or seller, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of who? Of his name. And that's one of the signs of the times. Again, as I asked the question, who will suffer the most here? Is it the rich or is it the, the poor? The poor. Because the poor really make, make up about the, what, 98, 99% of the earth population. So as a result of this, many of them will receive the mark of the beast because of their basic necessities. See, this is where we need to be like Christ. The disciples ask Jesus. We have uh, Peter ask. We have uh, forsaken all to follow thee. What will we have then? What did Jesus say to them? Jesus says, whatever you have forsaken for me, you will receive a hundred times more than what you have given. So whatever sacrifices that we make for Jesus, He promises that He will repay us a hundred times more. We are living in the, in the last days and the signs of the times are all around us. The mark of the beast will be imposed upon us very, very soon. It's time to seek for a place in the country. It to, it's time to help those that are less fortunate, especially those of our faiths, we were told. Notice with me what Sister White says here from uh, volume 5 of the testimony, page 152. Notice the year there, this was 1882. She says, the time is coming when we cannot sell at any price. The decree will soon go forth prohibiting men to buy or sell of any man save him that have the mark of the beast. We came, notice now, near having this realized in California a short time since, but this was only the threatening of the blowing of the four winds. As yet, they are held by the four angels. We are not just ready. There is a work yet to be done, and then the angels will be bidden to let go that the four winds may blow upon the earth. Again, the date was 1882, the year was 1882 when she wrote this, and she says, uh, we came close to see this uh, happen in California. Now, that was well over a hundred years ago. How close uh, do you think uh, we are right now, brothers and sisters? Notice with me what this says here. It, it says, uh, from Natural Blaze, uh, January 1st, 2018, uh, what's ID 2020? And are we, notice now, are you ready to become impacted by it? It says, it's called the ID 2020 Alliance and is the most comprehensive surveillance database probably to date and being implemented on where? On a global basis. As you can see from the international organizations involved, governmental agencies feeding it statistical data and the countries that will fund it. And here's the graph there that shows who are involved. We see United States of America, United Kingdom, Japan, European Union, Norway, and it goes on and on and on. To control what? To control the population, to bring about uh, the enforcement uh, of the no buying uh, and the selling. Notice another one here. It says uh, from uh, the routers, April 17, uh, 2018, uh, EU Commission proposes making fingerprints mandatory in ID cards. It says identity cards held by EU citizens will be required to include the digital images of the holder's fingerprints as part of a crackdown on fraudulent documents used by criminals and, ex and extremists. Pause there for a moment. Who will, who will be called the extremists in these last days? You and I, brothers and sisters. So these things are being implementing to target God's people and also to make the poor even poorer to condition them to depend on the system for their basic necessity. Back to the screen. The European Commission proposed on Tuesday countries that use them would be required to include two pieces of biometric data an image of two fingerprints and a facial image 
non notice with me now, non-compliant cards should be phased out uh, within uh, five years. So they're making the system in a way, they're structuring things in a way where we will have no choice but to go along uh, with the system uh, at the peril of our lives, at the peril of uh, not having uh, our basic necessity being met. But again, what did Jesus say? Whatever sacrifices that you make, if you become poor, if you lose everything for my name's sake, I will repay you. I will give you the kingdom. Another one here. Notice it says, your body and everything around you will soon let you pay for stuff. April 23rd, 2018, Amazon, MasterCard and others are developing new ways for you to spend, including Notice cashless stores and scanning the veins in your thumb. No, now, will you go along with this? Will you uh, put a chip in your wrist or wherever they want you to put it in order to purchase things? It's time for country living to grow our own food. Notice with me another one here from Bloomberg magazine, April 3rd, 2018. Cash dethroned where? In Russia, as its shadow economy goes uh, digital. Now remember, this is very important to remember. In Russia, they already have a system of church and state. A government where the church uh, really is uh, the, auto, the Russian Orthodox Church controls the church. And this is what we see in Revelation chapter 13. The image of the beast, church and state, will come together to enforce the mark of the beast and then no buying and selling. Now, this is in Russia now. Again, back to the article. It says, cash dethroned in Russia as its shadow economy goes how? Goes digital. So, they're already taking a measure against uh, those who are going uh, or who have uh, some new or different interpretation of scriptures that than the Orthodox Church or the main church there, as we saw with uh, what they've done with the Jehovah Witnesses, but we know as uh, Seventh-day Adventists, we have compromised, uh, we are in bed with the government over there, and that's why we're still standing. But now, they taking measure, getting rid of the rubble, and uh, getting rid of the cash into a biometric system. But notice with me the next few articles dealing with what's happening in Russia. It says there, Vladimir Putin mandates new rules for what? For cryptocurrencies and ICOs. Notice it says, the government of the Russian Federation in conjunction with the Bank of Russia shall ensure that changes are made to what? To the legislation of the Russian Federation providing for the determination of the status of a digital technologies used in the financial sphere and their concepts, including such as technology or distributed registries, digital letters of credit, digital mortgage, cryptocurrency, token, smart contract, based on the obligation of the rubble as uh, the only legal tender in the Russian Federation. So you will see what's happening in our world. It's, it's a global movement to get rid of cash by 2020. And we see many nations, as I mentioned in India, China, they already have this system and they are enforcing it on the majority. Notice another article here again, dealing with Russia, Bloomberg Markets, March 29th. 2018, Russia's shadow economy goes what? Goes cashless under state banks watch. Along with the rest of Russia, the gray economy is going digital, said the Yegor Grigorenko, partner at the Bain & Co. in Moscow. That's because transaction costs and operational risk is using online channels have become far lower in recent years compared to cash. Additionally, modest payments linked to small business don't get on the radar of uh, tax uh, authorities. Now, what do they call modest payments there? 
They, they're talking about the cash, but they're also referring to there are transactions that are being made that the government cannot track down because it's cash. It's being done with, with cash. So they want to implement a, a digital system, a biometric system, where they can control your behavior, your buying and your selling, and so they can also stop you from buying and selling. Same article goes on to say, notice now, it says, uh, the increasing visibility is creating a, a catch-22 for the government, which has long wanted to get a better grip, notice now, on the shadow part of the economy estimated at more than a third of gross domestic product. Although the new digital dimension is given a glimpse into activities that would otherwise go undocumented, it's raising the risk, notice now, of a crackdown on operations that may be nothing more nefarious than uh, transfers of rent for apartments or payments to tutors uh, and nannies. So what, what does that mean? What's the translation for this? They will be able to track down uh, every single move, every single transaction. So think about this. If you're renting, but your name is on a black list uh, and you can't uh, pay your rent with cash, uh, you have to use uh, the system. What if uh, your name, uh, again, is on that blacklist? Then you will not be able to make that payment. You will not be able to buy. You will not be able to sell. This is, uh, again, the reason why we were counseled to make preparation for such a time as this so that it will not take us as a thief. Notice with me one last article here. It says, uh, from Half Post, uh, February 16, 2018, in the rush toward a cashless society. The poorest are at risk of further exclusion. So again, who will suffer from this? Who, it's the poor. Again, back to the article, as it says there, in the rush toward a cashless society, the poorest are at risk of further exclusion. So brothers and sisters, this is the reason why Jesus says in Matthew 25, to help those that are needy. And uh, we are part of the needy. Doesn't matter who you are, how much money you have. You are part of the poor. We are poor, miserable, and naked. But yet we think we have a lot. So that's one of the signs of the times. To take care of the poor. To make sacrifices as many who came before us made sacrifices. I can think of Moses, for example. Moses... Uh, was in line probably to be the next king of Egypt. But what did Moses decide to do? As he saw his people struggling, and they were poor, they were in slavery. What does Moses do? Notice with me, go to the book of Hebrews with me. Hebrews chapter 11. Go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. The Bible says, speaking of Moses, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 24. Notice with me. In verse 24 of uh, the book of uh, Hebrews, chapter 11. Hebrews 11, verse 24. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, what did he do? Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer, to do what? To suffer affliction with the people of God. And uh, again, the background, where were the people of God? Where were they? In Egypt, in slavery, poor, didn't have anything. Moses chose to step down from the throne to become poor to help his people. That was a type of Christ. That was a type of what we just read in Luke 4. That Jesus came to preach the gospel to the poor, left the kingdom, left all the riches, left the glory to come here. Notice again, it says, Verse 25 again, Moses chooses rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to what? Than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming, notice now, the reproach of who? The reproach of Christ, the humiliation of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. What's the recompense of the of of the reward there. Moses was not looking at the earthly riches. 
He was looking at the heavenly riches. He was looking at the, the being with Jesus Christ himself. He was looking at the new earth. And he stepped down from the throne to help the people of God who were in slavery, who were poor. Then he says in verse 27, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he, notice the word there, for he what? Endured as seeing him who is invisible. So he made the sacrifice so that he might be a savior to the people of God. So he might endure with them. He became poor. Moses became poor because he saw the need. He made the sacrifice. This is what the God is calling us to do. As Jesus says, notice with me, go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 19. That's what it means to be one with Christ, to crucify the flesh. Matthew chapter 19, Jesus again was talking to the young man, young rich man who came to him and desiring and asking him a question about, uh, it says, uh, notice with me, verse 16, and behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have uh, eternal life? Skip on down with me. Jesus told him in verse 18 uh, to keep the commandments. In verse 19, uh, and the young man replied in verse 20, The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What like I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou will be, what's the word there? Perfect. So if you want to be perfect, to be holy, to live in my sight, in my presence. What must you do? Go and sell that thou hast and do what? Give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and do what? And follow me. Part of giving to the poor, as Jesus says, is to invest the talents, the means that God has given you into his work. As he says, in Matthew 24, verse 14, after he describes signs of the times and what would happen, persecution, he says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for as a witness and then the end shall come. Meaning we have to make sacrifices. As a witness, the witness there means martyrs. We have to make sacrifices. We have to surrender all, to give all. To God, give him your, your all, your talents, your means. After all, he was the one who blessed us with the means and the talents in the first place. Notice with me another passage here. 2 Corinthians this time, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And notice with me what the Word of God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep, what's the word there? Poverty, abounded unto the riches of their liberality. So in spite of their poverty, they were given freely. It says, for to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the, what, the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of of a God. So this group there from Macedonia, as Paul is describing, did not have much, but they were willing to make sacrifices, to give to those who are laboring for Jesus Christ. They were investing in the kingdom because they were looking for a better country as Abraham was looking for a better country. That's how the church operates back in those days. Acts, Acts chapter 2. Notice with me what the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 2. That's how the church operates. They make sure that, that they share whatever they had with one another, that nobody had any lack, any need. In Acts chapter 2, notice with me, verse 44. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 44. And all that believed 
were together and had all things common. And what did they do? Sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had, uh, notice now, as uh, every man had need. So they uh, brought everything together and uh, they, they uh, dis distributed it to make sure that nobody had uh, any lack, any need. And then the Bible says, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of, of heart, praising God. Verse 47 says, and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, as they were making sacrifices, as they had all things in common, as they were taking care of one another, of the needy among them, the Lord blessed them. The Lord added to the church. They didn't lack anything. Let's look at uh, Isaiah. A promise there as we make sacrifices uh, to God. God promised us as we will go through this time of trouble, when uh, the buying uh, and selling will be a serious one. Isaiah chapter 33 we're going to. When the buying and selling will be a serious one. Notice the promise of God here in Isaiah chapter 33. And the Bible says, Isaiah chapter 33. It says uh, in verse 16, Isaiah 33 verse 16. He shall, well, let's back up. Let's get the, the uh, background there. The Bible says, let's back up here. Let's go, ba let's go back to verse uh, 15. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly. The Bible says, He that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearings of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Notice now. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. So as we make sacrifices, uh, as we go through that time of trouble, uh, as we go through the time of no buying and selling, what's the promise of God here? That your bread and your water shall be sure. And as Jesus promised the disciples in Matthew chapter 25, uh, when you help the poor, when you feed the hungry, you have done it unto me. And then he says, uh, I will invite you to come and sit in my kingdom. That passage there in verse uh, 17 says, Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is uh, very far off. We will see the king in his uh, beauty. Exodus this time. As we're coming to a close. Exodus chapter 23. Notice with me what the Bible says uh, in Exodus chapter 23. 23. Again, keep in mind, background, the children of Israel left Egypt, the world, sin. They were in the wilderness, uh, journeying to the promised land. And the Bible says in Exodus chapter 23, notice with me in uh, verse uh, 25, it says, And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and ye shall bless thy what, thy bread, and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst uh, of thee. So what will God do for you and I as we make uh, sacrifices, as we help uh, the needy? He will repay us. He will make sure as we go through the time of trouble uh, that our, our bread and water will be sure that He will provide for you and I. A time of trouble is right upon us. The signs are all around us. As we close, notice what Sister White says here. From uh, Review and Herald, March 21. She says, hoarded wealth will soon be what? Worthless. When the decree shall go forth that none shall buy or sell, except they have the mark of the beast, very much means will be of no avail. God calls for us now to do all in our power to send forth the warning to the world. So God calls for us at this time to do what? To send the warning to the world to make sacrifices because uh, the signs are all uh, around us. Jesus uh, is uh, coming again. It won't be long now. This is not going to be a matter of 100 years. I don't know the day. I don't know the time. But one thing I do know is that uh, we must uh, get ready, get ready, 
and get ready. Let's pray. Loving Father, which art in heaven, we thank you, Father, for provide for us on a daily basis. You've been so good to us and help us to be a blessing to others as you have been a blessing to us. Help us, Father, to uh, invest in your kingdom by making sacrifices that would last throughout eternity. The reward that you would give us will last eternity. Help us, Father, to be prepared, to be ready, and to stay ready until you come again. In Jesus' name, amen.